acute vestibular failure is also known as labyrinthitis, vestibular neuronitis, or vestibular neuritis. It is believed to be an inflammatory disorder selectively affecting the vestibular portion of the 8th cranial nerve. The cause is presumed to be of viral origin. Clinical features The typical presentation is usually with the acute onset of the following vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and balance problems. These are due to the vestibular lesion that causes a sudden asymmetry of the normal vestibular nuclei neuronal firing rate. Symptoms generally develop over several hours, peak within the first 24 to 48 hours, and typically last several days before resolving without intervention. They are typically constant in contrast to the episodic symptoms of other peripheral causes such as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or Meniere's disease. Symptoms are worsened with head movement but not triggered. Patients will likely note a preceding or concurrent vital illness, but it is important to note that the lack of this history does not rule out the disease as it is reported to be absent in up to 50% of patients. It is vital to ask the patient about accompanying symptoms that may suggest central disorders of vertigo, such as visual changes, somatosensory changes, weakness, dysarthria, incoordination, or an inability to walk. If any of these are present, one must broaden the differential with central causes of vertigo. When the additional symptom of unilateral hearing loss is present, this shifts the diagnosis towards labyrinthitis. When attempting to differentiate this associated hearing change from Meniere's disease, it is important to know that Meniere's disease also presents with vestibular and auditory dysfunction. Still, patients with Meniere's have more episodic and not continuous symptoms lasting 20 minutes to usually no more than 12 hours. Patients will have a normal physical and neurological exam. The clinician needs to look for clues that might point to a central cause of vertigo, warranting a more thorough evaluation. Central causes of vertigo usually have continuous symptoms along with truncal instability, an unsteady gait, dysarthria, and other focal neurological symptoms. Symptoms that are episodic in nature point to the more common other peripheral causes like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and Meniere's disease. Other findings that are consistent with peripheral causes of vertigo like acute vestibular failure include a negative hinge exam. The hinge examination has been found to have high sensitivity and specificity for distinguishing peripheral from central vertigo in patients presenting with acute vestibular failure when performed correctly by the experienced clinician. The hinge examination consists of three components, head impulse, nystagmus, test of skew. The acronym HI indicates head impulse, N indicates nystagmus, and TS indicates test of skew. Now at first we will discuss about head impulse. Head impulse test detects unilateral hypofunction of the peripheral vestibular system caused mainly by acute vestibulopathy. Normally a functional vestibular system will identify any movement of the head position and rapidly correct eye movement accordingly so that the center of the vision remains on a target. This method will test this vestibular ocular reflex in a patient. In order to perform the test, the clinician sits face to face with the patient and holding the patient's head from the front. Patient is advised to fix their gaze on a target, usually examiner's nose, 
and the head is rapidly turned to one side and then to other side while watching the eyes for presence or absence of any corrective movements. If the right ear has intact peripheral vestibular function, when the head is turned to the right, the vestibular ocular reflex moves the eyes to maintain visual fixation. If the right ear has impaired vestibular function, when the head is turned to the right, the eyes move with it, breaking visual fixation and a refixation saccade is seen as the eyes dart back to examiner's face. Now we will discuss about nystagmus. According to the direction of first phase of nystagmus, there are two types unidirectional and bidirectional. If the nystagmus is only to the left or only to the right, then it is unidirectional nystagmus. But if the nystagmus is to the right upon right lateral gaze and to the left upon left lateral gaze, then it is bidirectional nystagmus. Observation for nystagmus in primary right and left gaze is done. If there is no nystagmus, then it is normal. In case of only horizontal unidirectional nystagmus, then the condition is reassuring. But in any other type of nystagmus, for example, vertical or bidirectional nystagmus, then it is predictive of central pathology. Now we will discuss about test of skew. To perform the test of skew, first have the patient look at your nose, then cover one eye, then rapidly uncover the eye. In a central cause of vertigo, when the eye is covered and then uncovered, the vertical alignment of the eyes may be different and a vertical corrective movement will be seen. Note that the hints exam should be performed only in patients with continuous vertigo because if not active continuous vertigo then vestibular ocular reflex will remain intact and head impulse testing will be normal with no corrective saccade observed. In case of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo where there is not continuous vertigo and in patients without vertigo Findings may falsely suggest central pathology. The diagnostic basis is mostly on key signs and symptoms of acute vestibular dysfunction as mentioned before. Neuroimaging of the brain with MRI or CT is not indicated in most cases but can be helpful when exam findings of a peripheral lesion are inconsistent if risk factors for stroke exist and symptoms do not show improvement within 48 hours. An MRI of the brain is more sensitive than a CT scan to rule out a cerebrovascular accident. Other tests like cervical and ocular vestibular evoked myogenic potentials along with video head impulse testing have made it possible to determine which vestibular division is involved. Most patients recover spontaneously. Some trials showed that glucocorticoids can improve outcome if administered within three days of symptom onset. Antiviral medications are of no proven benefit and are not typically given unless there is evidence to suggest herpes zoster orticus, Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Vestibular suppressant medications such as anticholinergics like scopolamine, antihistamines like diphenhydramine, meclizine, benzodiazepines like diazepam, lorazepam, and antiemetics like promethazine, metoclopramide may reduce acute symptoms. These drugs should be avoided after the first several days because they may impede central compensation and recovery. 
directed vestibular rehabilitation therapy may accelerate improvement. Patients should be encouraged to resume a normal level of activity as soon as possible.